Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jeremy Weinstein. I'm a professor of political science at Stanford and an affiliate of the Stanford King Center on Global Development. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to today's special event, the King Center Speaker Series, which features talks by distinguished academics, scholars, practitioners, and policymakers. The goal of the series is to foster discussion about successes and challenges globally around poverty alleviation and global development. Before we jump into the talk, I wanna share a little bit with you about the Stanford King Center on Global Development. The center is dedicated to stimulating research to alleviate global poverty and inform policy on development issues. This requires a multidisciplinary and multifaceted approach and the center supports large scale faculty initiatives and emerging scholars from all of Stanford's seven schools and facilitates student opportunities at Stanford and abroad. Which brings us to today's conversation about the future of aid. We know that COVID has been a devastating pandemic with enormous consequences for poverty and growth prospects around the world. And so it raises yet again, important questions about the role of the international community in supporting poverty alleviation and supporting the development trajectories in particular of the world's poorest countries. And one of the critical tools that the international community has is aid, foreign assistance. What is the role of aid and foreign assistance in reducing poverty and driving development? And to what extent at this critical moment are we likely to see wealthy countries heed the call for additional assistance, not only around access to vaccines or investments in public health infrastructure, but also to address the devastating economic consequences of the pandemic. Today's discussion is being recorded and the recording will be available on the King Center's website early next week. And we're so lucky today to be joined by two extraordinary individuals to set us off in the right direction on this conversation. Rachel Glenister, who's the Chief Economist at the United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and Nancy Birdsall, the President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development. These two individuals are really at the center of ongoing conversations about development policy and have been for some time. They're people that I admire so much in terms of the contributions they've made both to our understanding of development, but also in very practical ways to the pursuit of poverty alleviation around the world. Each panelist will begin with about five to seven minutes to share some opening insights. And then I'll start a discussion beginning with some questions that I have to get us going but also please use the Q&A feature so that you can ask questions in real time and I can bring your questions into the conversation. And with that, let's start with Rachel. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for the introduction, Jeremy. Very happy to be here and talking to you all. Um, I am currently a chief economist at, at the FCDO, but I've also worked as an academic um, before that. So, let me let me start by looking at some numbers because uh, that's what I do in both jobs um, and think about what is changing about poverty um, and therefore how aid has to change in in response to that. So this is a chart that shows the number of people in extreme poverty, so living on less than 190 a day and what that looks like over time. And you'll see in the 1980s and the 1990s, a large number of people in the extreme poverty were in East Asia uh, and in South Asia, and a fewer number of people um, in extreme poverty were in Africa. But you see a very sharp decline in the numbers of people in extreme poverty in East Asia and South Asia. But the numbers in, in Africa have not changed uh, that much. Now that's not because Africa isn't making progress. Actually, there's a, a lot of countries in Africa who've made a lot of progress in reducing poverty, but the countries that are the poorest have been growing in their population a lot. Um, and so the two factors offset each other. And the result of this means that in the future, aid is going to be overwhelmingly, or, or poverty is going to be overwhelmingly African and overwhelmingly focused on countries in Africa that, um, and a few elsewhere that have not 
been making progress against poverty, and those are fragile and conflict affected states. So our, by our estimates, 80% of those in extreme poverty will be in a few conflict and fragile um, countries within the next uh, decade. And that has huge implications for the future of aid, because that's where we need to be thinking about focusing our, our effort. Um, the other thing that is changing and that is part of uh, part of that story is that increasingly a lot of countries are able to finance their own anti-poverty measures. So a lot of traditionally what we would call developing countries, but middle, lower middle income countries and even some low income countries are spending a lot of money uh, of their own public sector money on the things that we traditionally think of as things that aid do. So on the left, you'll see a chart which shows how much money it would take or what percentage of GDP it would take to lift everybody who is under the extreme poverty line up to the poverty line in each of these countries. And um, as a rough kind of rule of thumb um, in, in the SCDO, we look at countries who are unable to finance their own um, you know, if they spent 1% of GDP, would they be able to lift everyone in that country out of poverty? And that, that starts with kind of uh, Nepal, Honduras, Ghana, all countries where just spending 1% of GDP would lift everyone up. So those are countries where um, they're increasingly able to do a lot of the basic spending on poverty themselves. And you'll see on the right a chart which shows that actually at the moment, you know, aid is not the main source, even in low income countries, of, um, of, of spending on education, but I could have shown you the health spending as well. So the things that we typically think of as of things that donors provide even in low income countries, actually most of that is is most of the funding for that comes from poor people themselves or from the governments in low income countries. Now, what does that mean for the future of aid? It means that um, it's not about gap filling increasingly. It's not about just giving money to countries because they can't afford to spend themselves. It's uh, increasingly about uh, you know, these three things, which is what, what aid does. It does, there are countries where you still have to provide capital, you still have to provide the basic financing because these countries are too poor to be able to, to finance health and education and anti-poverty measures. Um, and those were, in the, those were the countries in the left of that chart where you, know, you would need 40% of GDP in some cases to be able to lift people out, up to the poverty line. But for the countries, you know, we need a differentiated approach. So for some countries, we still need to be giving basic assistance. And obviously in a time like COVID, where there's huge needs, um, that's a bigger role of what we did in the last year. But we also need to be doing building capacity, helping other countries spend their own money uh, more effectively to the extent that we have resources or expertise that is useful to them. Um, and, and we also need to be helping provide global public goods. So as more countries get richer, aid is doing more of the capacity and global public goods part um, in the countries that are able to self-finance their own exit out of poverty. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about what, what I mean by capacity. What, what does that practically mean? when we want to spend aid on capacity and global public goods? Well, um, global public, let me start with global public goods because they're kind of easier things to explain. Um, so two classic examples are, are vaccines or um, improved crops. And this is, requires research and development, which has to be done once but once you've invented a new vaccine, lots of people can use it. Once you've invented a new uh, form of, of rice seed, which this picture is an example of, um, lots of people can use it. And so individual countries may not have the incentive to do that investment in R&D, 
but it's a very effective thing for donors to spend their, their money on. And we in the UK do a lot of both health research and um, agricultural research. So the pneumococcal vaccine on the left is something which donors committed to, to buy a pneumococcal vaccine if it was invented. Um, and that was extremely successful and rolled out across the world. Um, during COVID times, the UK also put some of its aid money into, uh, into purchasing and pushing forward the R&D for COVID vaccines. Um, and as I say, another area is agricultural. Um, so the, this, this picture shows um, an improved rice seed that um, is resilient to, uh, to flooding. And you see the, the, the non-resilient rice seed on the left and the resilient to flooding uh, rice seed on the right. And that is, you know, with climate change, adapting agriculture to, to um, you know, more severe climate shocks is a really important um, uh, uh, thing that we can do. Let me talk about capacity for the last minute, because um, sometimes people say, well, you know, what can we in, in, in rich countries do to improve the capacity of other, other countries? Shouldn't, you know, that ought to be their job. Well, one of the things we can do is link to the research and development. We can help fund um, research on the social sciences. It's not just the hard sciences. We can do research on, on in this case, um, we show this is, the, um, this is the, some work done on uh, improve, what, what research shows about the most effective way to improve education. And, you can both fund that research, but we also funded this group um, of experts to look at the research and pull out conclusions about what, what, what was most useful, what did the data say was the most effective ways to improve education. And now we're working with countries around the world to look at those insights and look at their own data and assess what are their edu own education challenges and how, how can the results of globally um, researched evidence suggests that they can improve their, their own education pro, uh, policies and therefore spend their own income uh, more effectively. And I think this kind of partnership um, is really an important uh, way in which um, aid is going as countries are able to finance much more of their poverty reduction themselves. Back to you, Jeremy. Thanks so much, Rachel. Let's go over to Nancy Birdsall to offer some opening thoughts and reflections. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm unmuted now. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here at Stanford while staying home on the East Coast. <laughs> uh, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity. Um, the future of aid. I'm going to ask a sort of large question. Uh, is rich world aid at a turning point of some kind? and then talk about, make a couple of points and then go back to the, the original question. So the first point is uh, that aid has been growing. It's grown by 36% since 2009. So over a little more than 10 years. This is pre-COVID, of course. Um, it's been growing because of or despite success in many ways, particularly success against some of the sustainable development goals. Poverty is down to less than 10% of all people in the world. Um, there are fewer countries, poor countries, eligible for official donor aid. Um, Ida is down to eight countries, and I think the DAC uh, countries <clears throat> are down to, are down by 11 anyway. So it's, it's a low number now, and they are, as Rachel suggested, concentrated in Africa. Um, independent of long-term development, many kinds of aid are up and that may be uh, encouraging or pushing from below in a way, the overall fact that aid is up. And those include humanitarian aid, possibly up because of climate-induced natural disasters, security assistance up, because of non-state uh, terrorism, uh, especially in Africa. Refugee aid is up 
there's aid to reduce migration. It may not be much, and I think it's misguided, but it's there. Um, global inequality between people, the richest and the poorest, is up. And that's driving some private aid, if you think of what the Gates Foundation does, among others. Uh, remittances are up, and they're seen as a possible substitute for transfers from rich to poor countries. And then there's uh, Rachel's point, many poor countries are seen increasingly as capable of doing more themselves in meeting the SDGs, for example. So that's the first point. The second point is that official, the official donor focus on aid effectiveness, I think is dissipating. And I don't, I'm not going to express an opinion about that, but let me just say why I think it's dissipating. Partly it's because of what I just described, that there are all kinds of aid that have relatively little to do with behavior on the part of governments of recipient countries. In addition, we are well past, here are signs of that dissipation. We're no longer in the structural adjustment Washington contentious era. Um, much more aid is going in the form of humanitarian and refugee and so forth, all the other kinds of assistance I explained. And they, that aid goes independent of countries behavior. Um, the SDR is indeed, it's an, a very good example. Uh, special drawing rights are on the agenda because of COVID and they would be very independent of countries behavior by definition because of the way the IMF rules operate around special draw, drawing rights. Um, I think most important might be that many borrowers now are healthy enough to access private capital markets. Uh, so, you know, you see many countries in Africa, Ghana, Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya, accessing private markets, and they may be choosing in a way those, that access to resources over the much more complicated, burdensome access associated with official development aid. And that's happening because of low interest rates, since, particularly since the global financial crisis in 2008, nine, or seven, eight, seven, eight, nine, 10, I should say, or eight, nine, I'm not sure, um, has kept the, the monetary policy response, has kept low interest rates at the world level and capital markets are searching for yield and they can get pretty good yield by lending at relatively higher rates to some of the poorest countries. So this raises the question, is the rich world architecture at some kind of a turning point? Um, and the signs of the turning point are some of the, the ones I just mentioned, um, but let me give a couple of others. First, I think the priority to traditional aid of a traditional sort is get, becoming more and more contested. Um, you, we have the expression decolonizing aid, that it's the aid donors that have power and money and knowledge. And this is wrong. It's the wrong setup for aid flows. I think this arises in part, at least in the US, as because it's analogous to the Black Lives Matter and the Me Too uh, movements, which emphasize this issue of power relations. And the fact is, of course, that knowledge plus money puts power in the hands of the powerful. Um, there's also a view among development economists that aid like oil money is a problem, particularly for countries in Africa, because it does what Dutch disease does. It reduces those countries' competitiveness in global markets. So, and the sign, one good sign of that to remember for those of you who don't know what I mean by Dutch disease is that in Africa, the, the cost of labor is relatively high. So it's very hard for the African countries to compete um, in global markets with exports, which was of course the way that the East Asian countries and other countries since have become richer. Uh, the second is that development advocates are pushing, and I think this is important, it's actually 
the focus of the Center for Global Development, where I spent many years. They're pushing for the rich countries to clean up their own house, um, to reduce carbon emissions, which raise costs and are, oops, sorry. Let me skip that. Um, they're pushing now on the intellectual property, property rights uh, issue associated with the COVID vaccines, pushing very hard for the US to give a waiver on the patent rights of the producers of those vaccines. Uh, for years have been pushing on the agricultural subsidies of rich countries, pushing on tax evasion, uh, on complicity of rich countries in bankruptcy in developing countries to the extent that rich countries fail to enforce their own anti-bribery laws. I could go on and on. Um, you know, one example that I have kept in mind for a couple of years now is that the US has higher tariffs on pajamas from Bangladesh than on lingerie from France. And this is not a conspiracy. This is just the outcome of the way the world works. So Nancy, one minute just to wrap up. Okay, that's perfect. I think it brings me back to the question, where are we in the aid business? Is it time to, in a sense, move on to a world in which for self-interest of rich countries, they pour money into uh, climate mitigation and into a, a pandemic response, into vaccines in, in the poor world because of the variants and the you know, that will lead to troubles back home in the rich world. Are we at a sort of change in the way we think about the developing world compared to the rich world? And I want that, I want to leave that as a question for Jeremy and other colleagues at the Stanford King Center and to those participating in the webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Nancy. Great comments from both Rachel and Nancy to get us started. And I already see questions being added in the Q&A and encourage you to do that. And I'll bring your questions in uh, as we go. Maybe the first question goes to Rachel and it, it really begins with this changing geography of aid that you described. Uh, Christopher wrote in in the Q&A, how should we be thinking about what's happening in middle income countries given this changing geography of aid? That clearly it's not the case that just because we've surpassed you know, uh, you know, a dollar ninety a day. That somehow development has been achieved for lots of folks. And so, what are the implications as you think about your role from the FCDO uh, for countries that may not have the extreme poor anymore, but still have tremendous issues of of inequality? The flip side, though, and, and this was the question I wanted to ask, is that if extreme poverty is concentrated in a very small number of conflict affected African countries in particular, it seems that politics is central to addressing the development challenge. Yet I didn't see politics in capital capacity and global public goods. And so maybe you can reflect a little bit on, on sort of countries that no longer have the extreme poor and where they fit you know, in the development conversation, but also what, what's the unique challenge for the fragile states that FCDO is trying to get its head around? A uh, great set of questions. Um, so in terms of middle income and lower middle income, I agree they they still have a lot of people who are close to poverty, uh, close to the extreme poverty and still, you know, in an absolute sense, very poor and a lot of challenges in health and education, etc. Um, so I think that's where um, we need to, one of the things that we can do as donors is support them, as I say, to use their money more effectively. So just to expand on the, uh, on the education example, um, in the very poor countries, we would literally fund schools, fund teachers, and in a conflict affected uh, situation where you know, the government has broken down, we will, um, as donors, be funding education in refugees. to set up schools. 
Um, but that's, that's not what you do in an India or a Brazil. Um, you know, they have funding for schools, but there are a lot of, um, you know, a lot of countries in, in Latin America who, who are spending quite a lot of money on schools, um, also in, in South Asia, but are getting not nearly as good results as possible. Um, where what, what our role can be there is to help fund research into what is the more effective way of doing education and then help help those countries get to um, get to a better better education policy so for so this you know that report that I showed we helped set up a global education evidence advisory panel which brought people from all over the experts from all over the world to synthesize the evidence and come up with recommendations in the way that we have recommendations for health from Lancet commissions or the IPCC for, the, for climate change and, and provide that evidence. And now we're working with individual countries. So that's one of the things that we can do for the for middle income countries. And it and it's got to be a, you know, a care, we're not, we, we as the UK aren't coming in and telling people how they should run their education um, systems, but we, but we can offer advice and you know this is how we did it in the UK or this is some research that we funded that might be useful for you so those are the, that's the kind of partnerships that, that we try and build on on your question on the um uh on on the franchise states and this is something that in the UK we spend a lot of time thinking about I'm not sure we have completely the answer um, but we know it's uh, you know one of the things we've been trying to do is get the international community and the multilateral development banks to focus more and put more energy into those countries um, but I think uh, it's also the case that that conflict destroys growth but it's also growth um, and opportunities for growth can can help people out of conflict because if you think there's you would get more out of getting a peace deal and getting you know getting the economy going uh, that is sometimes the motivator for people to come together um, and so that's uh, that's one part um, there's also just you know, actively trying to support peace deals and and providing, you know, saying, well, if you lay down your arms, you can get these goodies, um, you know, and trying to kind of create the, the, the incentives for people to do that. Now, when there's a lot of, you know, a lot of natural resources at stake, it's very hard to, to provide sufficiently attractive alternatives. Um, but and then, then I think of the kind of work that was done. We often think of the failures, but if you think of Sierra Leone, which is countries I've worked in for a long time, um, that's a great success of bringing stability. And the international community funded peacekeepers. It also funded uh, the recreation of democracy and, and put a lot of money into providing local government. So supporting decentralization which I think, I don't, I can't prove this, but I think was critical in creating stability because when a party lost power at the national level, it had its regional power base to, to go back to. Um, and, that, and that was really, that, that decentralization was very strongly supported by donors and, you know, and many people think was important in preventing a return to, to war when the ruling party lost an election. That's great. Thank you, Rachel, for, for tackling both of those dimensions of the changing geography of aid. I want to turn to Nancy with a question that, that takes us, you know, centrally to some of the issues with respect to development policy and, and foreign aid in the United States. As people might know, Samantha Power, the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, was recently confirmed as U.S. aid administrator. And if you pay attention to the sorts of questions that she was being asked in her confirmation hearing in the Senate, you'd see that a lot of the focus in that discussion was on how the US needs to use foreign assistance to counter China's rise and to counter China's influence. And Nancy, as someone who's been watching and engaged in the development policy conversation for a long time, you might think that this is the just most 
recent instantiation of a foreign policy frame being brought to our development assistance. This is the post 9-11 frame, is the countering China frame. How helpful is that frame as we think about development policy in the United States and support for foreign assistance? Um, and how do we think about the role of development at a moment of great power competition and contestation with China? I think the frame is helpful for increasing the size of uh, the amount of US foreign assistance. I think that I, we're learning more and more about China's behavior where sometimes it's bad and sometimes it's good. I think there should be much more pressure from the US with other countries in the G20 and through the G7 on China taking on the responsibility it has to participate in debt relief efforts. There's a huge problem now that the World Bank and the IMF, you know, they're reluctant to forgive some of their, the, the, the debt that is owed to them because they feel justifiably perhaps that the money would just be channeled, that those that debt relief would go to China as long as China isn't participating. So my approach would be, you know, to deal with issues like that, um, to bring out the fact that the Asian Infrastructure Bank is doing well, is upholding the usual protocols and standards that the World Bank has on all kinds of issues, to try to find ways to partner with China on debt relief, for example, um, and, and not to, certainly not to panic. Um, I think the condemnation is overdone of the Belt and Road Initiative. Some of the things that China could do better or should be on the table and, you know, constantly hammered in contexts like in the IFIs, in the World Bank, in the International Monetary Fund, in the African Development Bank. If the same amount of effort that is likely to go into sort of bashing China and generating a lot of, not hysteria, but sort of poor will, if that energy went into doing some of these more constructive things that can be done in the short run, then we see about the long run, right? We, we try to be measured about it and wise about it. Um, and it's particularly incumbent on the US because of the, uh, the larger conversation that has to go on, but it's incumbent also on our G7 allies. So to take the pressure off only the US to be handling the issue of China. That's great. Thank you, Nancy. Oh, the one thing I want to yeah, add, that I meant, meant to add, but I hadn't thought about it enough before, is that I also think it's very clear that the developing countries, including in Africa, are far more sophisticated about China than the US body politic might expect. They understand what's going on. They are pushing back. They are in a dialogue with China. So, you know, that should be raised as much as possible with people like Samantha Power. That's an important point uh, to, to emphasize. I, I wanna ask a, a version of this question to Rachel that has a slightly different uh, starting point and it, it was raised in the Q&A as well uh, by Rebecca, um, which is you know, the, the linking together of development policy and foreign policy, which is reflected in the kinds of questions that were being asked of Samantha Power at her hearing, also plays out in the UK context. And obviously, there's been a big move to bring these two streams together in the creation of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office out of what had been the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and DFID as separate institutions. Can you say a bit from your perspective about sort of the opportunities that come from bringing these two institutions together, but also some of the risks and challenges that, that you're paying attention to? Thanks. Yes, I was in the middle of this big reorganization um, of our aid policy as we merged uh, DFID and, and the, the Foreign Office to create the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, so one area where I think 
we uh, have not brought foreign policy and aid policy together very effectively um, in the past, and I hope we will do better and we're starting to do better uh, with the merger is trade policy. So, you know, CGD um, has for years made this point that um, you can do as much with trade policy as you can um, with uh, four, four countries uh, than, than just giving them money. You want to give them access. Um, and we actually have a large number of development experts sitting in our trade group, which is actually a third ministry, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, but but those, they, they, that works very well. And we have, as I say, development experts who were on loan from, from, from DFID or, or part of DFID and now part of FCDO sitting in the trade ministry, um, helping write as the UK exits the EU and has to write a whole bunch of new trade policies. We had all these, these um, development experts trying to make those trade policies, you know, rewriting them in a way that, that they hope would make them more beneficial for, for development. Um, but I see that at a very political level too. I mean, we're about to enter, we are entering negotiations with India on a trade agreement, the UK. Um, and that's obviously a lot of very, um, you know, important interest for business, but it's also very important for development too. I mean, the, some of that big fall in poverty that we saw came from India opening up to trade. So it's one of the huge engines of, of reducing poverty. So to be able to be kind of at the top table in a sense of, of um, in the political discussions with the ambassadors, I mean, we were there before as a development agency, but just kind of much more in the bloodstream of these foreign uh, policy decisions uh, to have development be integrated into that um, is very helpful. And, you know, as in part of our G7 presidency, you know, development is, is, is kind of right at the heart of that um, in, our, in our international COVAX, uh, work so the work on getting vaccines um, it, it was very close integration between our foreign policy aims um, on on COVID and our um, uh, and our uh, development aims on on COVID. So those are some of the areas, and you know specifically my my comparator, my you know my close colleague uh, Charlotte Watts, who was the scientific. Um, advisor at DFID as an epidemiologist and became the, the chief scientist of FCDO. And so, you know, to have someone who was a development expert on, on infectious diseases at the heart of foreign policy making in the middle of COVID was, you know, it just showed how important those, those issues were and having that expertise integrated into the heart of foreign policy making, um, you know, was extremely, uh, extremely useful to have. Good, thank you. Uh, I want to take the conversation in a slightly different direction, and some of the, the questions in the Q&A stream point to this as well. Um, Nancy used the, the term decolonizing development, and I want to dig a little bit uh, more deeply into that. Um, Arvind Subramanian and Devesh Kapoor wrote a recent article um, in which they raised concerns about what they called the absent voices of development economics. And they were challenging the structure of both development research and practice, uh, which they argued seemed to privilege Western voices and white voices in particular. And I'd, I'd love to hear from both of you speaking from the perspective, not only of the, the roles that you are in now, but roles that you've had previously about sort of how much do you think this critique is, is, is sort of resonant and right? And what is it gonna take to reform both the practice of development research, but also the practice of development policy to, to recognize the reality in some sense, Rachel, that was in, in your picture, which is that developing countries themselves are gonna be the main drivers of their own development trajectory. So maybe I'll start with Rachel and then go to Nancy. Okay, that is an enormously complicated question and issue, and I think, I worry a lot about some parts of it, and I think other parts of it 
I worry less about. Uh, let me let let me try and explain what I mean by that. I think it's so. On the research side, from from my time as being a researcher, I think it was extremely important uh, in everything we did that you know you can't do good research unless you really understand the context of what's going on in a um, in a location, and you can't sort of sit and write research in 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 the U.S. and you know expect it to work um, in in a developing country or in a low in, uh, income country. And so a lot of research is actually partnerships. Um, and anyone in research who works in this area hugely values the partnerships. I think there is a power problem in that though. In it is very uncomfortable and upsetting to me that you know the names that finally get on those papers are tend to be the researchers um, uh, in rich countries even though you know all of that we know depends hugely on the huge operations uh, of people collecting data and you know helping you think how to ask the questions correctly and and what questions to ask so there's good partnerships behind most research but unfortunately the voices then that talk about it often are are from from the rich world now fixing that is really hard. And I mean, a lot of us tried, have spent a lot of time trying to fix that and get to the point where, um, you know, there are a lot of good researchers in low income countries um, who, you know, who are part of, you know, have a, a stronger voice, uh, not just in the early parts of the research. And and it's, it's hard to fix because it's quite complicated um, and, and also, um, a lot of the, the good people who do make it then move to, you know, universities in, in rich countries. And you can't blame them for that because that's where they are able to get the money to do research. And actually, I think that's fine. So the one thing I would nitpick on that particular study is it looked at where people were based as researchers, not where they came from. So there are actually a lot more researchers. I'm not enough by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm happy that Tavneet Suri, a you know a colleague of mine at MIT who grew up in Kenya as the Kenyan and um, is now you know a tenured professor at, at, at MIT. I but, and to count not count her as knowing about Kenya is sort of so. I, I think we should celebrate that rather than criticize it. I think. You know, there's also a question of a voice in not in the research world, but in um, and there I think we're making more progress because, as Nancy was saying, kind of can, countries are getting a stronger voice, and and that's partly why people, you know, are pushing back on <laughs> on China. I mean, it's a low-income country that now has a big voice in the world, um, and people don't like that. They like the idea of them having the, you know. The sole voice and and Africa gets to choose about whether it goes to China or comes to us and that's quite you know African countries like being in that position of choice and it gives them a bit more power and it's quite uncomfortable for us um you know there's lots of negatives about China which I won't go into here but but that but that sort of opening of the system so there's more choices for people to go to and and be heard in I think is is, is a good thing um but, but we have a long way to go in research. Thanks, Rachel. Nancy, do you want to offer some thoughts on this issue of, of decolonization and, and what it means for the aid architecture? Uh, I think it's really worth more discussion. Um, I spent some time on the board of a think tank in Kenya. And at that time, several foundations had something going on called the Think Tank Initiative. In fact, I was on the advisory group for that, for them. And after two, three year rounds of grants, they stopped. I mean, the money that donors have, in my view, should go into some sense of what is going to encourage long-term development and growth. What are the keys to increasing the ability, even of 
you know, in the democratic sense of people in developing countries to have the conversation that happens in Washington among how many think tanks, 40, 50, about policy issues that's then shared with the voters. So if, if half, if 10% if of the money that's spent in fragile states were somehow spent in neighboring countries, think tanks and or universities, I mean, this is especially relevant for Africa. Africa could be treated as a single unit. And I keep thinking of how in the 50s and 60s, the Rockefeller Foundation, among others, helped start the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. So the analog of that now would be for donors to be topping up salaries of top people so they of think tanks to keep to compete to have top people stay where they would like to be and where, where they would like to see their children grow up in their own country um, make them competitive in attracting top people there are so many africans capable of doing so much in their own countries but reality speaks right money and power it's really tough. So um, I think it's useful to reflect on the contribution of the IMF and the World Bank over what half a century, more than half a century, wow, a lot more than half a century in ha having staff from all over the world, some of whom, more and more of whom go back to their own countries. Um, you know, if you think of Latin America in the 90s, so many of my colleagues that I knew at the Inter-American Development Bank were going back or had come from as finance ministers and heads of public expenditure groups, treasury secretary analog, uh, meta, uh, analog and so on. So I just think that it should be one of the big changes at this turning point for the aid architecture that I referred to. Go back to long-term investments in people, in development, to, 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 and including for fragile and conflict-ridden states. If, if, ha if a quarter, if a tenth, if 2% of the money we spend on development were dedicated to that, that kind of topping up salaries including for officials who go back, which donors, you know, they hide it. They don't want to talk about it, right? That they have topped up salaries of some top people who went back to their own countries and wouldn't be able to go back because they had mortgages and, and school tuition uh, in Washington. So that's my, my view. I think it would also help, frankly, if more focus went on rich countries cleaning house, as I said, on their own policies. Um, and on the whole issue of tax evasion is just a troubling one, where the OECD has done some good work, but much more could be done. And that's and, obviously been a big focus of CGD's work for, for many years, which is to focus attention on uh, rich country policies and their impact on the prospects for development in poor countries. I wanna ask a question about uh, global public goods and global public bads. Uh, both of you have been articulate about this issue in the past, seeing a critical role for development assistance and the development architecture to think about providing global public goods and preventing global public bads. Now, Rachel, in your presentation, you talked about global public goods largely through the lens of, of sort of learning and education and understanding. If we can flip for a second to global public bads, because we've just lived through a year in which anyone who didn't quite have their head around what a global public bad might be and the infrastructure needed to prevent global public bads, it's hard to come out of the pandemic not thinking uh, that, that there was perhaps insufficient investment globally in thinking about the risks associated with pandemic disease and, and spread. Maybe Rachel, you can start us off Sort of given your history of thinking about these issues of, of sort of where are we now? If, if global public goods and preventing public bads are a big, you know, 
need and, and sort of ambition for the aid architecture, where do we go coming out of the pandemic to really increase the level of investment and focus on that aspect of the agenda? Yeah, I think I think one of the things that became quite apparent um, in the middle of the COVID crisis as we were kind of scrabbling to respond um, was the a lot of the existing architecture that has money, which is basically the multilateral development banks are so the places with significant amounts of money, are all required to fund things country by country. So um, you immediately got the World Bank responding to COVID by providing additional resources to countries to do things like social protection, to try and support incomes, which is great and important and needed to be done. But the work that we were trying to do to get, I mean, from very early on, we knew that vaccines were going to be the key to ending this. And we knew and uh, certainly I and a number of other economists were banging the drum from you know March last year that you need massive investment in capacity to produce enough vaccines to do the whole world and not just not just rich countries. And that and that was, you know, that was the global public good that you needed to respond to the global public bad, as well as the as the research um, on uh, an investment on it. But the problem was that the people who were working on vaccines were over here and you know the bank was kind of designed for doing country by country so so there wasn't there wasn't um great architecture for for doing these investments to prevent global public bads um there's a little bit around climate change uh but even there it's you know investing in the, uh, the R&D that's needed for, for, to prevent climate change is, is much less than is needed by, you know, if you look at the, the likely cost. So, so I think we need um, better architecture, better by which we mean, you know, for people not familiar with that term, better, better organization of, 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 uh, of organizations, you know, different ways in which organizations work. To, to try and do a bit more, uh, you know, do the, do the critical investment that you need that is across countries. Um, because as you say, the pandemic is a very good example of how, you know, there are common things that we need to invest in and pull together. Um, and we also need to be able to respond quickly. So that was another lesson, I think, of everybody did more of what they normally do. You know, so there aren't a lot of people working on vaccines at the World Bank, uh, you know, and as they say, people tended to just do more of the thing that they were used to doing because um, because there was a big problem. Um, so that's that's, I think, another lesson. But I think critically, we need to put in place a process by which we have spare capacity to, to produce vaccines, because we now with our, our um, mRNA vaccines, we can turn around a new vaccine very quickly but we don't have enough capacity to produce a lot of it. Um, and that, that is, uh, that's what we were pushing for very early on. Um, and, and what, you know, we clearly failed to do enough of. And that's of course the moment that we find ourselves in now with tremendous vaccine inequity in the world, which is yet another demonstration of these issues around who has power and who has access uh, to resources, you know, on stark display. Nancy, any thoughts that you'd add on how we seize this moment uh, to increase the focus on, on global public goods and, and preventing global public bads? So I'm very frustrated like many people. Um, with Scott Morris about now three or four years ago, I did a report at CGD on the future of multilateral banking. And our first of five recommendations was that the World Bank should become a global bank and deal with global public goods and bads, and that it should do what it did with IDA more than 50 years ago. It should raise money. Uh, and I believe the World Bank could do it if it had the leadership. The problem has been 
competition, you know, in the early days on things like global public goods, climate mitigation, before there were pandemics. Uh, I remember talking with Zelik, then the president of the World Bank. And he said, well, the problem is that the developing country, the poorest developing countries worry that any resources that goes for global public goods will come from potential resources for Ida. And more recently, you know, under Wolfenson and then under his successor, I've lost track, uh, I guess, oh, especially Jim Kim, there was a cutback in one part of one fund that was called sort of institutional development uh, in the already small amount, but it was, you know, big relative to some of the institutions that it supported, like the CGIAR, the uh, Agricultural Research Consortium. That, that whole window has been pushed down from, you know, maybe a hundred million a year to three million a year or something like that, that is tiny. So the problem in the world, this is also, by the way, an opportunity we said in this report for discussion with China. China, if the World Bank set up a global public good funding arrangement, China could be, China could put capital into it. And the, the interest from the capital could be used to gradually build up uh, the funds at the World Bank for global public goods and bads. Spending on global public goods right now, I wish I had the number up my sleeve. I did a piece on that a couple of years ago, and it was just pathetic of all the donors, just pathetic, you know, including UN peacekeeping and IMF surveillance and, you know, everything we could think of that has a global public good component. I mean, it's like pathetic compared to what the US is spending now on COVID response as in probably a hundred to one, you know. So it's a really tough question to answer in a positive way. I think with different leadership, I mean, the IMF is much more helpful now on this issue. Um, I think the World Bank has moved even under Malpas from maybe we shouldn't use the word climate to now something can be done. But, you know, this is still, we're in a world where these little things just, it's depressing. Honestly, it's depressing. Uh, CGD had a terrific uh, thing this morning. I think it was internal on the COVID issue and what to do about that. And people were quite positive in general, but it was all still a little bit small bore. And, you know, there were so many different funds and institutions in the slides that if you weren't really on top of that discussion, you couldn't easily follow it. Yeah. Um, so, and then well, we have the intellectual property rights issue where it's obvious the US should issue a waiver. So we need to work hard, I think, with the US body politic on, and maybe Samantha Power on. We, we, def we definitely have work to do on that front. I, I don't wanna end on depressing though, in the sense that, you know, Rachel slides situated us you know, in the current moment in a powerful way by describing the changing geography and changing burden of extreme poverty in the world. This has been a period, as everyone knows, of just tremendous expansion of opportunity, improvements in income, increases in, in, in sort of, uh, you know, life expectancy and like around the world. And yet we find ourselves at an inflection point, an inflection point in terms of where poverty is, in terms of what it means to think about positioning the world to respond to global challenges as opposed to localized or national challenges. And so as we finish this conversation today, which could obviously only scratch the surface of these complex issues, I think both Rachel and Nancy have given us tremendous food for thought as we think about how to seize this moment, how to seize this moment so that the next decades ahead of us can deliver as much progress as the decades that were immediately behind us in terms of progress in particular in addressing poverty around the world. So 
I hope you'll join me in thanking Rachel and Nancy for sharing your perspectives with us. Um, this was a tremendous conversation. You can find the recording of today's event up on the website uh, in the next couple of days. And we hope to see you at an upcoming King Center event soon. Thanks everyone for your time uh, and take care.